Joe? Here. John? Here. He's not here. Greg? Here. James? Here. Alex? Here. Justin? Here. Jen? Here. I'm here. Mike? Here. Julie? Here. Pete? Here. And Mary? Here. All right. We have a treat tonight. We've got a musical presentation, and uh, I'm just going to turn it over to, uh, uh, to, to our maestro, Mark Obowitz, and, uh, and then to Beth Harvison. And so much and at this time I believe Mr. Harvison will thank you Ben Graham, I'm going to talk in this case. Um, ben Graham arranges for the pentatonic, but he also arranges for this acapella, acapella group um, for USC. We have a huge acapella competition um, every year. USC has walked away five times uh, with the time. And this one particular piece I heard on off the chorus here last year, oh, it's kind of very difficult to talk about the chorus if you know anything about music. There are <coughs> So, everybody comes 
much. Now you gotta close your eyes and think about Christmas and snowflakes, right? Here we go.
every um, every holiday concert should have carols or bells. So. Um, Thank you very much. We are going to move on to the recognition of art students, and I'm going to turn it over to our superintendent. All right. All right. Well, good evening, and in a continuation of the celebration of the arts, um, what a wonderful treat for the holidays. And I think, um, Mrs. Gallo, I know that we've already seen our teachers, but please know how immensely proud I think we all are of the programs and performance tonight. So. So continuing on with some of the arts, I think we also get to celebrate our artists also at our elementary schools. And I see that we have uh, principals Emily Judd and principals uh, Kathy Coella here as well, who are here to celebrate their students. And we thank you for coming out tonight too. Um, so the first person I would like to invite up is Celeste Palumbo. Celeste is a first grader. Come on up, Celeste. You want to come stand right next to me? No, you're going to hold that. You're just going to nod yes or no. Do you have Mrs. Manley as your teacher? OK, excellent. And is that your blue chicken over there? Excellent. And are you a really good artist? Then you deserve a round of applause. Stay right here with you, OK? The next artist I would like to invite up is my friend Liam Hill. All right. Is your teacher Mrs. Manley? Yes. And what school do you attend? Burnham. You were willing to talk. I like it. And what grade are you at Burnham School? Third. Third. Can you come stand right over here so everybody can give you a round of applause? <laughs> and we have two of our artists who are not able to join us today. However, I would like to recognize my friend Logan Belanger. Um, we also, from middle school, we have Anna Swanson. And I also, we have, representing Chapog, we have our 11th grader, 
Adriana Burrell. Adriana, you want to come on up? You did it perfectly. So, so she said to me her biggest fear was not standing in the right spot. I think she's done a fine job. However, what you're going to see, and I want to see where your artwork speaks for itself. If you look over at that salt and pepper shaker that's over there and the artwork you see, you will see the work of her AP efforts. And I think that is a testimony. If you look from where we start, where we continue, we are absolutely full of talent here in Region 12. So I think a round of applause for our artist. artist. And at this time, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I believe we do have some cookies and some uh, water that we'd like to share in. And we'd also like to invite our families to have pictures with their principals as well as their artists by their displays. We will take a brief recess. Thank you. Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order and we're gonna move on to a uh, presentation on the uh, Naugatuck Valley Community College Partnership uh, Program. Um, I have to apologize. I'm going to be the one who's going to do the presentation. Uh, Michael Boucher is actually the person who organized and brought this opportunity to Chapog. We had wanted him to present. Unfortunately, uh, he was sent home this morning against his own will, but we wanted to make certain he stayed healthy. So I have to apologize for that. So um, what I want to share with you is really the broad brush stroke of what this entitles. Um, through a partnership that um, Michael has established, we will be working with the um, Naugatuck Valley Community College. And what our students will have the opportunity to do is to actually take college courses free of cost through this partnership and exchange. And so it is once again, the opportunity to provide more options for our students at a small school to get them uh, those who are interested onto the college campus to make certain that those who want to be college bound have every opportunity to get there. And so maximizing those um, connections. And so because he's pulled this together, we will make certain that our students benefit. Ms. Scala, did I miss anything that you can think that I need to incorporate? So Ms. Gallo, I'm just gonna say it into the microphone just so that way everybody can hear that. It's okay. So right now uh, what she shared is that we do have about four or five students who are interested and to know that this is only so far just been a conceptual presentation to the students and we're already seeing interest. I think again, is a credit to seeing the need and filling that need. So again, um, I applaud Mike Boucher for seeking this out and making it come together. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's now time for public comment. Not seeing too many members of the general public here, so uh, we'll move on uh, to the consent agenda. Is there anything on the consent agenda in the way of minutes or policies that anyone would like to take off? Hearing nothing, those items will be adopted. Uh, I guess it's time for my, my report. Um, I will say before this, before the meeting started, I was actually in watching the, the basketball game, and we Chupag was up 11 to four when I left. So uh, I, I hope that they continue the pace. That was some really aggressive and good play out there. Um, I'm sorry. Two at halftime. So you actually got another shot out there. Good. Um, all right. Uh, Every summer, our governor supports a competition for schools uh, and students to see which school reads the most books. And uh, all of our schools participate in this competition to keep up with their reading skills over the summer months. And I'm proud to share with you that of the nine schools recognized in the state of Connecticut, three of them were ours. Fully a third of the schools were uh, ours. Uh, each of our elementary schools was recognized. Uh, and uh, there's some wonderful pictures of, uh, of the superintendent and our students with the governor. And uh, so this is really another great accomplishment for our region. It shows the hard work that our, uh, and, and, and great, great work that our kids are doing. Um, so we were three of the top nine performing schools in Connecticut. I think that's pretty good. Um, over the weekend of November 22nd, Chapog Dramatics showcased their interpretation of Outward Bound. I had a chance to see that. It was uh, quite a good show. Um, and for those of you that don't know, one of the stars of the show, Jake Diller, was also a co-director. So we had a student in, in direction on the show. And that's always always a good thing. But again, our 
our theater program continues to, to do extremely well. Um, we had the AgriScience Tour here on November 23rd. It was attended by more than 70 people. It was a large crowd of people. Uh, <laughs> the most frustrating thing for me is, you know, you're leading a tour into a room, and it takes you about about seven minutes to get the people into the room. You spend about a minute and a half or two minutes in there, and then, then you move on to, to taking five minutes to get out of there. Uh, but it was that large a crowd. Uh, one of the things that was really fantastic is our, our faculty was here, our students were here, and there were some great presentations by Ag STEM students who have been in this program for not two months, and they were up there uh, really taking us through the kind of things that they do. And it was really, it really was a tremendous, tremendous effort. Um, our ribbon cutting will be, will be done in the spring. And uh, I will tell you that our visitors were very impressed with the progress of the school. Uh, I met with people who were not only had their students in the school and were people from the community in general who wanted to see the school, but there were kids and parents who would like to attend and have applied to attend. And they were extraordinarily favorably impressed with our facilities and our program. Uh, and uh, there you go. So it was, a, it was a great day for all. Uh, the Holiday Bazaar at Chapag, I was here for that too. Uh, and um, uh, that allowed students to bond as they raised awareness of funding for their, their various opportunities, clubs, classes, causes. Uh, even with two snow days last week, they managed, and this was very much largely student organized in, in many respects, they managed to pull it off. Uh, with, with a shortened schedule, and they did a wonderful job. We had a lot of people here, uh, and I'm telling you, the attendance is creeping back up. It's doing well. It's really making progress, and I think we've, I think we've, they, they really did us proud. It was a wonderful show, and there were a lot of great things and a lot of great ideas. And, and you know, one, once again, it's just a, a, a festival of just great things that have gone on in the, in the last, since the last time we were here. So uh, that more or less is my report. All right, well, I'm equally as proud and have some other things to show off, too. Um, so I want to recognize our debate team, coached by Fran Bellison. Uh, Fran coordinated the November 16th debate in which we had 150 students who thought for, thoughtfully presented points and counterpoints regarding impeachment. Um, this past Saturday's debate was equally as challenging, and I have to congratulate our sophomore, Wyatt King, for his fourth place Novice Speaker Award at the debate on Saturday. This victory qualifies Wyatt for the statewide finals in March. Um, and again, testament to his supports, testament to Wyatt, it, it's really outstanding. Um, I also wanna celebrate, we have mathletes. I know we get excited about our athletes. We have mathletes. Um, they are coached by Marin Maher and the eight students, eight students who have um, been competing at different high schools. And um, they are so proud of themselves. They have actually fundraised for their own gear. So they have their own uniforms. And again, it's, it's one where what you're seeing is it's a celebration of academics. And I think that's what is, um, again, making us very proud. At the elementary level, I want to congratulate Shannon McVeigh at Booth Free, who won the 44th annual Spelling Bee. And as tradition stands, we complete that competition with pie eating. So. Um, continues to be something that is well attended and celebrated. Um, our Spartan Club received the Michaels Cup Award uh, as they promote good, citizen, uh, good sportsmanship. So not only are we showing uh, great valor in competition, we're also showing great honor. And I think that's a testament, again, to our schools. Sheila Gambino's robotic students, Bella, Jack, Nick, and Sean, are uh, the Samson Saul for tomorrow's state finalist. Um, so they had to come up with a humane solution to control the geese who nest in our pond. Um, this was an idea that came to them from Don O'Leary's frustration. And so to see that what teamwork does and our students solving the problems that we are encountering locally, and if anybody has ever walked that area, you will appreciate a solution. Um, we also had our winter season that has just begun. Our Chapag teams have begun uh, their competitions. Middle school teams, we had 119 students registered as athletes in our middle school. Um, at the high school, we have 125 registered athletes who are playing basketball, ice hockey, indoor track, swim, and cheerleading. So 
Yes, no, our students are busy. So not only are you seeing them in their arts, we're seeing them in their athletics, and we're seeing them in academia. And again, the well-rounded experiences of all of our students. Um, I did want to follow up with the board. There was a question regarding the gunnery soccer fields and use. Um, Mr. Parachi did uh, weigh in and he shared that they actually do utilize all of their fields because they have four separate teams. So I did want to make certain that I did follow up with the board regarding that question. Um, I also want to recognize our alumni, uh, Chris Murray, who discovered a new species of crocodile. Um, he is a Roxbury, it was Roxbury resident, and um, just so you know, his senior project was about reptiles. And so to see that he has carried it off, it is just a testament that great things start at Chipog. Um, and on Wednesday evening, I was able to join Dr. Emily Rue in Hartford as she was celebrated as the Region 12 Teacher of the Year. Um, for anybody who knows Emily, she is a wonderful representative of our staff. She's a special education teacher at Booth Free School, and you will see someone who has absolute um, compassion, who has the ability to collaborate with her colleagues and rise everybody up to feel successful. So we were quite proud of that. Um, and so tonight I have our personnel and we have an appointment. And at this time, I would like to inter uh, introduce you all to Megan Thimble. So Megan, if you would please come up to the podium, we would like our board to meet you. Uh, Megan will be serving as our farm manager here at Chicago School. And her position is as we are developing our program and we recognize that we are developing the agri-science program and we have to develop the educational side, but we also need to make certain we develop Chipog Farm. And so coming into Megan's expertise and whereas she is not a, a teacher, she is certainly going to educate us all on how to do this. The idea with this um, position is to get us started up while we transition the um, responsibilities over to the students. So we recognize this is a time sensitive position. However, we know we really need somebody who's gonna give us the guidance to make certain we are humane with animals. So at this time, I'd like to introduce you all to Megan Thimble. My name's Megan Thimble. I look forward <laughs> to getting to know everybody. Um, I look forward to developing your ag program, uh, working with your students, um, getting to know what everybody wants in the uh, program, because there's a lot of different aspects I want to help tie in. Um, my background is ever since I was six years old, I was in 4-H, FFA. Um, was she, I started with market lambs, I went to breeding sheep, um, worked on a private estate with horses and sheep, and then went on to work on a dairy farm of 700 head. Um, I have been around livestock, chickens, pigs, goats, all my life. So it's just my life, it's my passion, and I look forward to helping integrate it here. Welcome, Megan. Good luck. Uh, I was just interested in what you just said that you are looking for other people's input as to a kind of a program that people want. I assume that you will give direction. You will give your input as to what. You yes, <laughs> I'm looking to see what your teachers want to incorporate in their classroom. So I know what kind of animals I want to bring in. Do I want to bring in ones that are pregnant? Do I, you know, as far as developing your farm? as far as what kind of genetics do your students want to show at fairs at the summer, do an SAE program with your FFA. Um, I want to be able to tie it all and I want to have that range of animals and agriculture in general for them to do. Thank you. <laughs> 
Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> I think we're, uh, you know, we, we have tremendous, tremendous anticipation for, for, you know, what you're going to be able to do here with uh, getting this farm off the ground because we, we sure need the help. And uh, as you can see, we have high uh, aspirations for our kids and for yes. doing things. So I'm, I think some of the ideas you have, you, you should keep talking about them. And uh, I, I know that they have been, I know that they're, they, they did some work initially. They went to a competition. I think the very first week school was open, but it was it related to, to plant uh, uh, arrangements and things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know that there's there's going to be a lot of interest in 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 competing at these events, and I think those programs you talked about sound marvelous. So, thank you, and I look forward to getting to know every one of you. Okay, thank you. And. And she's already gone out and done visits to farms and checked out. We were going to purchase some sheep, but it turns out they weren't pregnant, so we didn't want them. Um, so, so to know that she's already looking for bargains for us. Um, but it's also, uh, we, we are very excited. And I think this is what we need to push um, some speed into our program to, to build up our farm. And so I, I think we are in very good hands. So we appreciate that. Um, Continuing down our list, um, we have Logan Messina, who will be our long-term substitute for English language arts, uh, as we have a resignation of Christine Scott. Um, I do want to applaud Mrs. Gallo's uh, planning ahead. And so Logan, who was a student teacher here at Chapag this fall, um, Mrs. Gallo saw that there was an opportunity as he was co-teaching that actually if we shift some of the classes, he can just continue through the year with some of the um, classes that he had been student teaching, so there's no transition, as she's going to have Mr. Shigru take on some of the other classes. Um, so finding that balance and doing what's right for kids, appreciate, but knowing that right now, um, the good news is even though we will miss Ms. Scott, we have a plan, and we know that our students will be able to stay the course. So thank you for doing that. Um, and that concludes my update. Great. Uh, it's now time for the treasurer's report. John, what have you got to tell us? Uh, it's going to be brief because our meeting, our facilities and operations uh, finance meeting was uh, that was scheduled for December 2nd was canceled because of the weather. Um, however, I did um, review the October 31st monthly budget expenditure summary that Nicole conscientiously uh, forwarded. And after encumbrances, we have a healthy balance in all of the accounts. Um, there was a grand total of 16.42% of the budget remaining unencumbered as of October 31st. So um, and part of that, uh, in my last report, I made reference to the fact that our director of finance and our staff were auditing the bargaining unit's uh, benefit plans. And um, Nicole has informed me that she has received a secured report and anticipates premium reductions. That means the encumbrance on the 200s employee benefits fund will be reduced. Um, to my knowledge, Nicole was not uh, pressured or prompted to investigate the possibility of reducing insurance costs, but apparently she took it upon herself. And um, looking at ways to reduce overhead should be applauded and, and encouraged. I, I may be fiscally conservative, but at the end of the day, finding ways to obtain savings should be paramount, not only for the business office and the finance committee, but this entire board. Public money is a public trust. We need to keep this in mind as we approach and make preparations for next year's annual budget. And um, I think Alex is going to um, mention a few ways that we're going to try to do this. Good. Thank you, John. Uh, well, we'll move on to committee reports. Uh, Cade, Mary. Um, I was in touch with uh, Cabe about 
the uh, the the student <coughs> the the problem that I had with the law enforcement unit uh, uh, piece of the uh, student records policy five one two five, and I found and they were good. They they got back to me right away, and the answer to that is that the law enforcement unit is whoever the Board of Ed has empowered to enforce the, the law, which is an, an SRO or, a bo or board security or anybody that we hire to do security. It doesn't mean any, it doesn't have anything to do with ICE. So I was glad to hear that. And also I told them while I was on the phone that I was interested in testifying uh, to the state uh, for CABE about uh, immunizations, about the religious exemptions being taken away uh, from, from immunizations. And uh, I want to do that. It means a lot to me because I'm a health care professional as well as a Board of Ed member, and it's important to me. So that's all I have. Thank you. OK. Uh, curriculum, um, Mike. Um, we didn't have uh, a new meeting, but I just wanted to thank um, Ms. Gallo and um, Superintendent Bennett for uh, moving forward with um, Naugatuck Valley. I think that's very exciting, and I know that's something that the uh, Education Committee has been asking for and looking for for many years now. Um, so it's nice to see it come to fruition. Um, that's that's really exciting, and I think we just had conversations about ways to open up the schedule so that students can have more choice, and this is just one more way to give them more choice. I think it's um, really exciting, and um, look forward to hearing where it goes. Excellent. Um, finance and operations, Alex. Um, well, uh, the weatherman was not kind to us last week. Uh, we were, had a meeting scheduled for Monday, which we did not have, obviously. Um, we've not had a meeting since our last board meeting. Um, what we will be focusing on um, in the future uh, is, one, the, bud the budget for next year, that we're going to start on that. Uh, there are a couple of issues that, uh, uh, some small, some larger, uh, one being uh, our banking relationships, and uh, Nicole is looking into the, whether we should be moving banks and saving some money that way. Um, our current banking situation is relatively expensive. Um, also, uh, we want to review the cafeteria situation, and uh, finally, um, how we're going to monitor the agri-science budget outside of the overall budget so that we can uh, have an idea what's happening with uh, with the agri-science program. Um, I think all these things have, uh, Nicole has is, uh, agreed to, and I think that uh, we'll proceed with those. Um, that's it, but I'm, I, uh, I'm more than willing to take a couple questions if there's some questions. Jen. So I'm getting used to this whole new committee thing. So I asked Alex about the facilities being part of this. So I'm going to piggyback off of that and ask some questions about facility, if that's OK. Go ahead. OK. So <clears throat> I've been asked this, and I don't know if other board members have over the years. I know it's something that Pete has talked about in the past. But I'm constantly being asked this question. And so I think I want to be able to kind of address this to the board and maybe see if the facilities uh, committee can talk about this. but. Um, there's a, a questions a lot about local contractors not being used in our schools. We see, I, and I'm not talking about the, um, the uh, construction going on up here, but just as a whole at all of the schools when there's any sort of um, work that needs to be done, a lot of the trucks are outside of our district. A lot of times I see Torrington trucks, Waterbury trucks. And so the question keeps getting asked, why aren't we using more local contractors? And so I would like to be able to, and we've discussed this a lot in the past, correct, Pete? But we would never really have addressed the question or the issue. 
And so I'm really going to ask the facility part to really discuss this and to come back and maybe present to the board about ways that we can really start um, doing our due diligence and reaching out to our local community and being able to incorporate them into our schools, not just when we're having them come to volunteer their time, but also to um, have them work in our schools. I think that that is for us, being in a small community, the very least that we can do. And obviously I don't want us to pay more to have them, but I think we should at least give them the opportunities to work in our schools. And if, if it is a cost issue, then we can sit down and say, well, this company's paying this. I, I just, I, I've been struggling with this for a very long time and I'm growing very frustrated that I've gotten nowhere um, in the questions that I've been asked several times being on facility myself. And so that's the question that I would like to be presented to the board um, very soon, possibly. Okay. Other other questions? Well, let, let me address that. Um, I, I think that's something we will definitely take up at the next meeting. Um, and uh, I mean, a couple of advantages you can think of is just travel time. Uh, obviously, a local uh, contractor is not going to take an hour to get here. Um, so theoretically, that should help in their pricing. Um, uh, my experience has been, though, that the local contractors sometimes are not the lowest bids, and uh, there's going to be a trade-off between costs and buying local. But I agree that uh, we should give, well, I don't want to call the word preference, but preference mm -hmm. to, to uh, people that are in Region 12. So, okay. Uh, John? Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with um, Jennifer. Um, I think, you know, in the lead up to ag, it was suggested that we should hire local contractors, but then we found out that since they were not union, <coughs> it wasn't possible. But for things, local, you know, uh, maintenance type things and small jobs, I definitely would uh, urge us to hire locally. Pete? You could have a set aside program, that's what they call them. Have a set aside program <laughs> in your budget of X number of dollars that you give out to local contractors. Uh, of course you have to give everybody to agree on the board and get your facilities manager to uh, accept that theology because he has a set group of people that he calls on and somehow we have to find a way to break into that theology <coughs> of, you know these are the people I use these people mm -hmm. I hire of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. so when you introduce set aside program it basically tells him that a, a certain amount of business has to go to local contractors mm -hmm. it's worth a try I think we should try it we, we really haven't tried it it's worth a try in this way you'll find out whether it works or not just, um, my, my, okay. um, just uh, one suggestion as you're, as you're looking into it, I can't imagine we'd be the first um, small district to look at doing something like this. So I would love to know, you know what our surrounding communities are already doing if they have such a program. Um, I mean, you know, I'm well aware that we, we have policy, board policy for any kind of expenditures and, and that we're always looking um, for the most part at the lowest bid, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other districts that have other criteria that they're also keeping keeping in their mind. All these things aren't even bid. Yeah. I just also wanted, because I was thinking when we're talking about our agri-science program and we're having local farms that are help, helping our program, I just feel like it seems very, um, it doesn't feel genuine to me that we wouldn't use local businesses in the same way that we would be using local farms to um, enhance our programs. So for me, if we're truly putting our money where our mouth is, right, and we're a community, a small community that embraces, I, I just, for me, I feel like, I, and it's been very frustrating for a very long time and I haven't seen it going anywhere. So I'd like for once to actually start seeing an opportunity where we're allowing local contractors to come in and start working in our schools. Well, just, just in fairness, we, we do hire local contractors. We have a number of them that have worked for us uh, since I was involved with facilities. Uh, uh, 
uh, that have actually been in the in the district and have been working for the school. The other thing is, don't forget that uh, we a lot of the contracts we we do that we bid out. If it's a real small job, I mean a really small job, we have people in house that do it. Uh, I mean, we have a, you know a maintenance people who are who are electricians. One's an electrician, for example. But uh, if if there are jobs that we generally bid out to be done, they have to be bid, and uh, they are bid, and they are advertised locally. And anyone who is local can bid on jobs that we offer. And um, I I know that 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 has been uneven at best over mm -hmm. the years. That Don has said he really isn't getting any bids from local people. Um, and they are advertised locally, uh, in, in addition to being advertised in the, in the traditional publications that, that contractors look to for when they, when they take bids. Uh, but I think it's something we certainly could look at, and I'm sure that, uh, that, 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 that Alex's committee would do it. Yeah, Jen. I, I'm, I'm not trying to argue your point, but I have to tell you that the local contractors that actually reach out to me don't if there is that process they don't know it and they've been in this community for yeah. a very long time so whether that's been either not actually happening or hasn't been advertised I, I just I have people in my community who aren't even contractors saying I'm so surprised when I go to go for a walk at the river walk and I'm seeing trucks from Torrington all the time and why aren't we using local communities so I, I appreciate that I'm sure we do use them but n nobody's seeing them so it if it it doesn't look good if we have a lot of trucks that are here outside of our community. Um, I, and I, I think the perfect place to look at that is that we do have a local purchasing policy. So I think that's our first place to look and say, is that something in which do we want to expand to a situation like um, what Pete has recommended? So that may be worth reviewing. And Alex, we can certainly look to put together an agenda for that. It might, you know, it, it might be something simple, too, that, um, you know, maybe Don's um, idea of advertising is placing an ad in a local newspaper that most of the contractors aren't looking in. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they're relying more on electronic forms of notification that we don't have. I, I just don't, maybe a little bit of detective work needs to be done there. All right. Um Move on to labor negotiations, Jim. Uh, we are in the throes of negotiating with the teachers union, and the negotiations continue. Our next session is scheduled for Monday, December 16th. Hopefully we'll be able to reach an agreement on that night. But that's where our next session. OK. Uh, I'm sorry, you got Alex. How would you characterize the, ne the negotiations? Uh, would you characterize them as going well or badly? I'm, yeah, I'm really not at liberty to discuss it. We have ground rules, and it's not supposed to be discussed publicly. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, I would say it's cordial. Both sides have professional <clears throat> representatives, and we are making progress. We have made progress, um, but that's about as far as I can go. Okay, thanks, Jim. All right. All right, uh, strategic long-range planning, Julie. Okay, we had a meeting tonight, and uh, everyone was there along with staff, Teresa and Mike Croft and Megan and Greg joined us as well. Um, <clears throat> the bulk of the meeting was a marketing presentation from the 111 group, who I mentioned, I think, last time. The CEO, Janet Carlson, came and started by telling us about their successes with the Cornwall schools. And I think everyone on the committee was impressed uh, by their work. Um, she also shared with us a broader idea of marketing to the entire Northwest Hills area, which includes six regional school districts. Um, she thinks she may be able to get funding for that <clears throat> from the Northwest COG, for one. Um, and then she also has drilled down to talk specifically what sh about what she would do for Region 12 Chapog and agri-science. And so we're just getting down to that. We will be sharing that with the whole board as we get further along, but we're encouraged so far on the topic of marketing. As far as strategic goals, we didn't get to dive into that too much, but did decide that we would have an off-site 
um, retreat of sorts with the committee to kind of do it on a Friday morning and bang into that so we can dedicate a little more time than just an hour long meeting. So I'd say we're making good progress. Very good. I, I, I was most impressed with her presentation, by the way. And I, I, Cornwall had a large increase in the number of people that tuitioned in and came into their program. Uh, and she's recruiting from, from areas that are not all in Connecticut. That's the other thing. Uh, it's really amazing work that she did. I was impressed. It was a great meeting. Jim. Yeah, Julie, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't listening closely enough. You were talking about that she was hoping to get funding from somewhere for what? She has a broad concept, and she has shared uh, a proposal on that, where she's trying to bring in families from, in some cases, outside of Connecticut. She herself came from New York City and picked Cornwall through a search process for her own family. And so she's looking at asking the Northwest COG, um, who covers Roxbury and Washington are both in that COG. Bridgewater happens to be in the one that's south in Fairfield County. But to look at them, they have funding set aside. She says she's top of the list to do a marketing campaign where they bring in, they look at bringing in families from New York, Massachusetts, et cetera, um, to the entire Northwest region, not just Chapag. Thank you. Mike. Um, I have a question, and I, Megan, maybe you, you could best answer this one. Um, if we have a student from uh, another area, let's say outside of our catchment area for um, Region 12, um, and they're interested in a specific type of program that we're offering here that's surrounding programs like, let's say, Nanawag doesn't offer, could, could we enroll that student, or are we kind of forbidden based on the agreement? We are not supposed to compete with Nanawag. So um, as far as their specialization, I don't know that we have anything that's more specialized. Um, so it, it is one in which um, we're not trying to have a, a competition within them. So we recognize that there's our catchment area and we're trying to utilize our sending talent. We, we've worked with Harold Mackin on any special considerations, and I'm not going to say that we haven't had some of those conversations. Um, and at that point, you, you plead your case to the state, and they, they make the decision. But it is one I can tell you we, we will work with the superintendent and their town. OK. If there's nothing else on the committees, I'm going to move on the agenda to new business and updates. Uh, and we're going to start with a, year, with a year in review slideshow by Ben Allen. If you recall, we had a year in review slideshow earlier in the year, but it was last year. Now it's this year in review. I'm looking forward to this.
and that was terrific. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item, which is a uh, graduation robe change in tradition. Yes. Um, as you can see, everything that we're doing, it's about unifying our district, and it's about the opportunities that we give. And um, I think one of the things that uh, becomes ever present is currently when we graduate students, they either get a white robe or a blue robe based on gender. And I think that really what we want to show is that our students are graduating Chipog. It's unified. We know that we have a lot of students who may be having some issues with gender fluidity. They, they may have some moments in which that should not be a decision that they have to make public. There should not be something where we have to put anything on display other than our pride of graduation. Um, so what um, I am going to be moving forward with this year is to have a singular color graduation. So it's one in which I didn't want to have surprises. We don't want to have anything um, that is, uh, you know, I know that some people like the contrast or there's tradition, but I think it's about evolving and making certain students are comfortable in the moment that is most celebrated. So we will be making that shift. We're going to talk to students about that. Um, we will make certain we're communicating with our parents um, because it is one we want this entire celebration to be happy. And so I think sometimes when people are surprised, it's it sucks the energy out of what is really a fantastic celebration of achievement for our kids. Okay. Uh, Ag Science update, back to you, Megan. Okay. All right, well, we are, our recruitment efforts continue. Uh, we are in the days of application preparation. Applications are due to students' um, guidance offices by December 20th. We want them before they go into the Christmas break, um, but they are actually due to Chapog by January 3rd. Um, I received a wonderful email today from Lord Trotto as at this point we saw three more applicants come in. So uh, we do see an onslaught by the end of the month, and that's where we really um, but to say that we're already seeing some really good signs that our trends are continuing. Uh, Kim Gallo continues to talk me down from a ledge, which I appreciate um, because I think she gets a phone call about every half hour right now checking on numbers. So to say that we recognize the push, um, but we also did um, a, another wonderful push, and, and I like the way that things are happening in rotations and we're layering it. So as Lori Travato goes and has talked to the sending schools, um, we've had follow-up conversations. Just this week, we had a letter go out to every eighth grade home for our sending um, students. So everyone, regardless if you're interested or not, you're gonna talk about us. Um, and so again, it's making certain that we are constantly a piece of conversation with families because a lot of times when they do the presentations at the school, it's to the students themselves. So bringing the awareness of an opportunity is an important one to get right into the homes. Um, so you heard about Megan and our large animals. Um, I can tell you that we're already talking, I think we have alpaca coming next week. Um, as, I, as she talked about, we have two goats that are currently she's going to go meet to see if they're appropriate for our program. We have sheep, and again, um, even though the ones that she went to visit did not work out, she has uh, another farm that she's going to visit. So I think what we're going to see is a fast and furious entry of our animals now that we have the ability to care um, for them right here on site. And again, um, her she is the farm manager. The other thing that Megan did not mention is she also specializes in pasture rotation. So she also understands the importance of the growth cycle, what has to happen, how we have to move animals between the different spots to make certain that we're also caring for our Chapog land. And that's something I will tell you until sitting down with her, we, we weren't really having on our radar. So again, recognizing that we have somebody who is an in-house expert. Um, I also want to share that um, our students in the agri-science program uh, did have a did compete in the forestry uh, competition. We got 10th out of 11 schools, but 
not bad for a program that's only been here for about three months. So to say that every year will creep up a little bit more, um, but to hear the students, and it's about actually going and putting ourselves out and learning how to have those speaking skills <coughs> and learning the aspects of agriculture. Um, we also competed at UConn, and we took, um, we had a fifth place individual plant science um, winner in the floricultural competition. So congratulations to Julia, because she got fifth out of 60 students. So again, um, we're getting some nice name recognition early on. Um, we do have an agri-science honors challenge in which students are currently setting up personalized research projects that they designed and that will start in January. So things such as finding out the pH and growth for productivity and sustainability of soils. So um, again, even though this is still in its infancy, our students are stretching for opportunities in independent projects and practices. Um, and I can tell you that since the power structure and mechanic shops have opened, our students are currently now working on the designing and construction of energy systems. So every time they open up a space for us and construction is complete, we immediately jump in and start uh, utilizing the space because our program really is moving forward. So I'm quite proud and, and happy with the progress. John. Yeah, Megan. Um, has the cohort still been holding at 46? Yeah. Uh, yes, we have not had any attrition um, for our current the bus season. ride is becoming a little bit more tolerable. Uh, they have they have normalized um, the the bus ride. Um, we we have made certain um, as we've checked with our schools, we have not found the two hour bus ride. I know that there was a statement and it may be off days, but we are constantly trying to monitor. Now, I'm not going to say we're talking to the bus company and asking those questions, individual experiences. So I'm not going to I'm not going to downplay, but I am going to tell you we are watching because we don't want to be a burden on our families or students. Um, but uh, I, and I'm going to speak for um, Scalo in saying that we hear very positive things. There are regular check ins with our agri science students to make certain that we are meeting their needs. Um, and we have had students in the drama program that are agri-science students. So the question of if they are accessing some of the extracurricular, they are. And also as um, we're introducing some enrichment activities in clubs to our middle school students, part of that is also our agri-science students who are running some of those in their projects, which also makes them feel like they are part of the fabric of this school. So I think efforts are taken even through the school day to make them feel included. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, it's obvious that once they take Nanawag out of the equation, the ride will be shorter. So, all right. The building. Oh, yes. Good. Just one quick question. Any progress with Bethel? Um, they are willing to have uh, the board hear from us. They wanted to see the program once it's operational. Um, they have told me that I am welcome to come to a board meeting in the spring. So we are continuing that conversation, um, wanting to make certain that we cultivate the relationship. And their statement was really a, they, they wanted to see the program, so they weren't willing to purchase sight and see. We are progressing closer and closer to the day in which ONG and their, their contractors will be off the site. Um, if you noticed, uh, within the last month, uh, less actually, the ONG trailer and most of the trailers have disappeared from the site. They are off the site. ONG is now working out of a, the room back next to the cafeteria. Um, that front is now being used by the landscape contractor to stockpile all the dirt he's removing from the other end after it's been screened, all that topsoil. Uh, that topsoil screening program could have been a construction site in itself with the amount of time that that's taken, the amount of topsoil that's been screened. It's truly amazing. Uh, but we're at the point now where we have more or less finished this build, the inside of this building. The science labs are, for all intents and purposes, constructed except for one little thing. There's no casework in there, and there's no casework because the casework has been significantly delayed. It's been delayed because the company that was the casework company's uh, parent company apparently went out of business. And uh, they are 
committed to producing the work for us and having it here on site by the 16th of December, by next Monday. And they are, their game plan is that the installer is putting on extra crew so that we can get that work finished. But that has definitely been a holdup in the science labs. Uh, but one of the things that I took it upon myself to do with ONG is I said, look, I, I'm not going to wait until the day after it's supposed to be here for us to find out they haven't done thing one. And so as a result, what they're doing is they're getting frequent pictures from the manufacturer showing us precisely at what stage the, the, the thing is. And they're staying on top of them uh, and riding them. So I expect to have the science labs finished. What they've done is they put the floors in, which normally don't get in until the, until the case works in. And they have put up things on the walls and done other infill work so that this is going to be a fairly quick thing. The ceilings are done. Everything's finished. They just need to put the case work in place and, and hang the, the uh, 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 smart boards on the walls, and, and then those science labs will be more or less ready to go. Uh, so we expect to have them this month, as promised, but they're a little bit later than we would have liked to, to have them finished. Um, after that, the only thing that really remains is, is F building area, the, 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 the uh, arena, riding arena, and, and a large animal building. And the site work associated with that, including their pasture and outdoor riding ring, um, that's all in progress. That building is moving along fairly quickly, and it's expected that it will be finished on time. Um, the site work, uh, if they don't stop, if they could only finish screening that topsoil, we could have the, we could make a little more progress on the site work. But they have more or less removed it from the area that's the turnout pasture. That area is now just about getting its grades finalized. Uh, and then they'll be moving on to the outdoor riding ring area as soon as the, as soon as the soil is off of that, that property. Uh, so it's, it's definitely moving along. The ins inside of that building is, uh, is moving along toward completion. And um, it, is, it does appear to be on time. So that's, that's where we are. So with any luck, sometime in January, we can celebrate the completion of, of the job. Um, Supposed to be finished December 31st, but I think it might be December 45th or December 50th or something like that. But uh, you're considering that, that these things are really out of the control of, of, of our construction manager, they're doing the best they can with delays in the system that have come through. But the, but the project is almost, it really looks like it's moving toward completion. Uh, they, I haven't been out there since last Friday, but they should have... They should be well on the way. They were putting in the concrete uh, for all the curbs and things around the F building, uh, and they, they were expecting to be paving this week. So my guess is they're going to be paving the areas over there, and that's starting to start to look a little bit more finished. Um, but we're not quite to the point of giving you tours of that building because it's still a little bit dirty inside, but we're getting there. Jim. Yeah, two things. Number one, on the large animal building, I was up here on Sunday, and there was quite a crew of guys out there working on that building on Sunday, which is unusual. And number two, excuse my ignorance of construction, but what is what is casework when you're talking about the labs? Casework are all the cabinets, or the cabinetry, the, 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 the cabinets that have the sinks in them, that have the gas in them, the cabinets that where they hold the beakers and other laboratory stuff. It's basically all the if you can think of your kitchen, all the counters and, and, and cabinetry. Lab tables? Lab ta well, the tables are actually furniture. Those are not the problem. The problem is actually the built-in cabinetry that has to come in. And once it's in, it needs to be placed. The upper level one needs to be, need to be hung on the walls. They do all that with lasers and, uh, to find out where they go. And then uh, they need to install the sinks and the plumbing and the gas piping. And it's all roughed into the spot, but they need to connect the, the fixtures. And, you know, this is, this is a couple of weeks or a week's worth of work, at least, maybe 10 days worth of work to get all that, that done on those, those two labs. And, um, but as you can see, we did reclaim a portion of the library. Uh, you can tell because the carpet is different. That's the new carpet. And uh, so uh, when the uh, Operations and Finance Committee comes to you for money to put new carpeting in this space, if you walk over to that little corner, you're going to see why, where they cut it in in some beautiful shaping work, but it's clearly two different products. Um, but in any event, uh, what's behind there is nearly finished, but for the cabinetry, but for the casework. Thank you. Um, 
I know there was something else I wanted to I wanted to mention to you about it, but it's uh, it's escaped me. But but that's that's really where we are. We're 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 almost done. Oh, and by the way, we uh, are carrying a we're still carrying a surplus uh, of approximately I want to say about three hundred and forty thousand, four hundred thousand dollars. But we're actually going to get a ninety thousand dollar credit on something, so that's going to be boosted back up. Uh, so we're still under budget and uh, on time-ish, uh, which I can say is it, it's on time if, you, if you're on where the current schedule projects it. <laughs> but it's not the original schedule. We're a little bit late. Yes. Um, I just have a question. In Megan's report this weekend, you had mentioned that the problem with the, the painting on the, the circle, the bus circle, did that get resolved? And... We are purchasing signs for starters, um, and I have reached out to ONG because um, we're months in and to have where it's already been yeah. rubbed away, but that said, it was paint going on paint. So um, I've asked ONG to find what is another solution. Okay. We, we don't want any near accidents. No. And when we evaluated the space early on, there's a reason we turned it into a one-way um, right. area passing. It's just we want ultimate safety. So okay. thank you. Thanks. Um, for those of you that had noticed that uh, when the sidewalks were done in the front, the line down the middle of the sidewalks is not straight up to the building. It kind of does a nice curve. Uh, that middle section of concrete is going to be removed during the Christmas holidays and replaced um, so that the lines are actually straight. We've been sitting here waiting to put the Chapog medallion in the middle of that for a long time. It's sitting on the side. But they don't want to do that until they've re-poured that concrete. So that concrete's going to be re-poured uh, over the Christmas holidays, and uh, they will correct that that error. Uh, and so that I know a couple of people have asked me about that. They said, "Boy, that looks a little bit cockeyed," and it is, um, but it'll be fixed. Mike, sorry, um, Greg. I know we've talked about this in the past, and I know it's the the bow on the the final present. Um, but the, the Chapog sign as you enter, any news on a possible new sign, or are we stuck with that, that dog of a sign that we No, have? well, we've, we've talked about it, but we haven't made any, any, we haven't done anything. We haven't initiated anything on that thing. I, I have further conversations with Don O'Leary about it the next time I see him, and we'll see if we can't. I, we, we do need something. We do need to redo that, that, there's that sign. There's a couple of ideas that we've had for the front of the, the, the property, but um, we, we sort of are just blue skying them at this point because we're focused on trying to get the bloody construction project finished. Uh, if we do nothing else, that has to be done, um, and so we can we can move on. And um, but you know that I I've, I've been I the first thing I I took a look at was that that sign. It's just not very attractive anymore. It's seen it's better. It'll help. I'll I'll, I'll help you with a sledgehammer to it. <laughs> I've been told that I'm not allowed to wield a sledgehammer around this this property. So, uh, that's right. Conversation only. Okay. Um, we do. Oh, we we do have a financial update. Um, so Nicole has shared uh, some updates, and really, it's just more of just uh, letting you know where we are. There's no big movement in some of these numbers. Uh, so payment for application number 15 was issued to ONG, as well as the payments to the other contractors through September 30th. Uh, no additional applications uh, have been approved due to the canceling of the building committee last week. Application number 16 and invoices for work done through uh, October 31st will be considered by the committee at the next meeting for payment prior to the year's end. We are about a third of the way through procurement uh, for phase two of ff &E. So we're, we're getting there. The next is a big purchase we are looking to have come forth in January. Uh, we are working on adding additional agri-science accounts to the budget for the 2021 year, as well as uh, the program takes shape. We want to continue to identify the needs for which new accounts are necessary to maintain transparency in spending. The agri-science accounts are segregated with 62 as their location code 
So that way we can always look up any budget line item and expenditures. This will allow for the sorting of spending for the program and can also be reported separately than our, uh, our budget. Um, at the next meeting, Nicole will circulate a year-to-date report of the ordinary program expenditures, meaning how much we've actually spent at AgriScience as a program to date. So that will be separate than what is being spent for the state and building funding. So again, we want to make certain that we have transparency as an answer to, um, to the people who have supported this program. Um, so again, this is where right now, as Greg said, and we will reiterate that currently right now spending is tracking as projected. Okay, we will move on to action items. Senior class trip to Pennsylvania on April 24, 2020 to April 26. At this time, I would like to invite Principal Gallo to come up and please explain and chat about the opportunity for our seniors. Well, as you know, each year our students, our senior students have the opportunity to party with Gallo for the weekend, something that they really look forward to. They don't even notice I'm there, but we'll just pretend like that's what they look forward to. Um, this is a very cohesive class, and they wanted to plan something different. Uh, I've never been to the Poconos, but <laughs> it, not not that weekend. Not that weekend. <laughs> Those most definitely will not be featured on this trip. Nope, not with this principal. Nope. <laughs> okay, so um, what the Poconos, um, the, the opportunities that the kids have arranged, and this is a, a, a kid arranged trip. They do the research and they vote on it and, and they make uh, the agenda together. Um, it's a day filled, it, it's a weekend filled with kid stuff. It's, it's really kind of cool. Um, we're leaving at 5.30 a.m., uh, the first morning, the thing that they look forward to the most is stopping at the grocery store in Southbury to get their snacks. Uh, it's really, you have to see it. I, I'm going to film it one year because they, they really, we let them loose on this, this poor grocery store and everybody winds up smiling by the end of it because they're so excited to pick out their snacks. Um, and we move on to Hershey Park, uh, rock and bowl at the Skylanes. I'm Looking forward to that. Um, and, and a pizza party. Uh, we're back to the hotel somewhere around 11 o'clock the first night from 5.30 a.m. Um, yeah, yeah. On my tombstone, it'll read, she was a good sport. Um, <laughs> the, sec the second day starts early for, for students. It's at 9 a.m. And they have um, different arcade adventures from which they choose. Uh, bowling, rock walls, um, laser tag so on and so forth. Um, I'm planning an event called Writing Evaluations in a Corner. Um, it really proves to be an exciting event. Uh, then they're going to an indoor water park. They have a dinner buffet where they dance. There's usually another school there, which is very, very exciting. Um, because you know we all get to jump up and down in one tight circle. It's really, it's really quite festive. Uh, and we go back to the hotel again. And the next day, we wake up, um, we check out of the hotel, and we go to the premium outlets. Those of you that have known me for more than five minutes knows I will glaze over in ten seconds. And again, look for a quiet spot to write evaluations. Um, the kids really do have a ball, though, and it's jam packed. It, it, when you look at the agenda, you can see that it's jam packed with activity. It really is a bonding experience for kids. Um, we have a blast every year. Uh, and uh, let's see, where have I gone? I've gone to New York City, Boston, Virginia Beach, and now. The Poconos. So I've rounded out my travel experiences and uh, bonded with a lot of really nice kids. Yes, Jim. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? All those, uh, yes. <laughs> There's a slot. I could stay home. It's really okay. <laughs> Well, Alex, I hope you enjoy yourself. That'll be <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? 
abstaining. Chairman votes aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. On to policies. We'll start with a se second reading of policy 5125 on student records. Is there discussion? Mary. Yes. So as I told you before, we've clear, I've cleared up the, the portion about the law enforcement mm -hmm. unit that it's not ICE. It's only people that we empower here in Region 12. So I make a motion that we pass it. <laughs> All right. It's been moved and accepted and, and seconded to accept for a second reading. Uh, is there further discussion? Uh, it's probably nothing but on page 6. In paragraph 12, uh, the last bit of the sentence says, uh, I think it's supposed to say, in the event of such collection, but it just says, I. That's the only thing I really noticed. Uh, yes. The last line. Yeah, my, my, mine says, in. Mine does, too. Huh. I guess there's different versions of it. Depends whether they like you or not. Yeah. Well, it, it definitely has to be in, so it's a good call, good catch. Okay, so with with the correction of making sure that the the I is in uh, on the last line of paragraph twelve, is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Chairman votes aye. That is unanimously adopted uh, for second reading. Uh, first reading of policy 5131.911 on bullying. Um, and, and thank you, Mary, for doing the legwork. I can tell you we had shipment also. They sent us their model policy that was 42 pages. And the long and short was ICE was not involved either. So <laughs> I can say we, we did that with great confidence and well-researched. Um, so what we are proposing for the, um, the policy um, 5131911 on bullying, uh, the state had, uh, had looked at legislation on bullying, and there were provisions within the legislation that talked about it was a repeated pattern of behavior. And so one of the things that, that puts, um, puts in question is sometimes there's something that happens as a one time or something that you're waiting for a pattern and what defines a pattern. And so to note that what CABE has recommended for the alteration is that instead of saying the repeated use, it is an act that is direct or indirect and severe, persistent and pervasive. And so that allows for more consideration of different incidences to be considered for bullying. So um, again, what you can see is that they've created the outline. And our proposal at this time is to, um, when we went before the Curriculum and Education Committee, was that we accepted CABE's revision to the policy, as our policy was really utilizing the model policy for CABE. Um, Mike or any of the members, is there anything else that I missed in our conversation? I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. I am confused. I have got two uh, 5131.911. Uh, which one is it? The marked up one that we're cons and the other one was what? That was our the original. That was our original because we wanted people original. to see, yes. And so that way there's comparison. Do. I got you. Thank you. Not the old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Yeah, 
I mean, I, I'm not talking about Trini Atkins all the time, but this guy for example is not. And I had it on here earlier, I was reading, and it disappeared. It's not on my drive or shared drive. Some policy still is not. All right, do we have a motion to adopt this for a first reading? Second? Uh, moved and seconded. Uh, is there anything in this policy that you feel, you feel is particularly uh, um, controversial or something you want to discuss again for a second reading, or do we think that this is something that can just simply go on to the consent agenda? Yep, we all, we, we can. All right, well, if you haven't had, I mean, I've, I've read this and it was a, it was a real slog to get through it, but if you haven't, yeah, if you, ha if you haven't done it, uh, please do. Um, uh, we'll take a vote then if there's no further discussion on, uh, accept on that motion. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Chairman votes aye, it's unanimous. That's approved for first reading. Uh, policy 5114, suspension. Uh, this is for a first reading. Um, um, and what this does is this, uh, again, looking at CABE's recommendation for language, and we really, it's trying to make certain that we keep students in schools. And so recognizing that to be expelled, that the conduct must be found in both violation of the board's policy and seriously disruptive of the educational process or endangering persons or properties. It's again making certain that the threshold is, is that we are looking, of course, safety is paramount. We do not want to disrupt the educational process. We also don't want this to be a solution that is, is easy to administer. We should be really battling with the idea when it comes to expulsion. Um, and so recognizing that we want to keep it on the two thresholds so that way it's an and rather than an or. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Joe, I'm sorry. Jim, I'm sorry. I wasn't Megan, sure. Megan, why do we want that? Yeah. Um, why do we want an and instead of an or? The reason that because I think we need to make certain that one, is it holding to what is our board policy as well as considering it against if it's disruptive um, to the school environment if it's a compromising of safety. So right now, when we look at our policies, there's, per, there's permissiveness. I, I think that there is um, the ability for us to evaluate what has occurred. But it is one, I think, that we don't want to make it look like it's, a, it's an or, because or creates more opportunities. I would like people to know that really this is where we have done everything to try to keep students in, whether or not we've provided counseling, whether or not we've provided, at some point, some of the due diligence does fall onto the schools to make certain we are servicing the students and that an exit from school is a last resort. I, I, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, I, and our policies are broad, so I can only assume that if somebody endangered the person or property of another, I assume there's not a situation where that would not be in violation of a board policy, but I hope that we don't find ourselves in that situation at some point where somebody has done something very serious and yet it's not a violation of board policy because we, it's just not addressed and therefore there can't be an expulsion because there's not both. But that's my only concern, but uh, I, I'm sure that our board policies are fairly extensive and that any such conduct would be a violation of board policy. And I, I do appreciate the statement, and I think that the sanctity of the school is an issue that we need to look at to balance that. <clears throat> Further comments? John. So what is the line between Suspension and expulsion. How does one determine what the appropriate punishment is? Um, 
within our policies, we do have a, um, a list of things that are expellable offenses, um, things that include um, one, if you brought danger, physical danger to or harm to, to anyone on campus, a threat to self, um, threats to harm, um, endangering safety. Uh, I'm going to say weapons that are involved. If there's things that we're talking about, um, drugs on campus, again, things that at this point introduce the element of danger into our campus, those are things that can be considered for expulsions. Suspension. Um, can be something where there's a fight in the hallway. You know, those, those are things that, um, so there's a level of danger that is evaluated against. Um, expulsion is, is a, a serious situation. You have at that point impacted the educational um, well-being of the student and that's also where if we do expel a child, we have the responsibility as a school system to still educate them even if it's not here at Chapong. I just want to make the point too, um, John, that the state uh, fairly specifically delineates what would be an occasion for expulsion, and I would imagine for suspension too. Um, so there's not a lot of creativity, and there's not a lot of place for local control uh, on these these policies. These because it's state statute that we're we're simply following. Um, they don't want us to be creative on that one. Um, one thing I noticed, and I think this, I think this policy may need some cleaning up, uh, is in the beginning set of definitions that defines firearm, it then goes on to define it twice more. Uh, it's sloppy. This is a sloppily prepared policy when it comes to that, because when you get definitions where there's a, where there's a, if there's a distinction, and I haven't read them carefully enough to see whether there's an extinct, there's a distinction. You, you could very easily find yourself miss, miss, uh, you know, with, a, with an inconsistency that allows someone to avoid a suspension over that. For example, if you look at uh, under A11, you'll see firearm defined, and then you'll see it again um, uh, in uh, F4. It, it goes on to say it includes, a firearm includes a sawed-off shotgun, machine gun, rifle, shotgun, pistol, revolver, or other weapon when loaded or unloaded, from which a shot may be discharged. So I understand that, but you, wh why would we define firearm twice? I mean, n normally when I mean, I, lawyers draft documents all the time, and when we draft a document, we create a defined term so that we don't have to ever repeat it. We, we can use the term without defining it again. So what you want is you want a definition of firearms that is broad enough to include everything you expect to include, and then you never define it again. Because when you have inconsistent definitions, that's the hole through which an attorney walks their client and says you cannot suspend them because this was not a shot-off shotgun. Instead, it was something else that explodes. And, and, and then they, they look for inconsistencies to walk it through. And that's why I think this policy needs a little bit more work. Uh, so that we have one definition of each defined term and only once. Define it and then use the term. And it saves space. That's the other thing it does. It'll save a couple, you know, half a page. Uh, I, I don't know whether, there, I'm not sure that there's anything, pardon the use of this term, fatal in the way the definition is, is done a couple of times, but why have the chance um, that, that someone can walk right through a loophole? That was my only comment. Otherwise, I thought it was not a terrible policy. Obviously, you have to use judgment in these things because the idea that you can be expelled for sort of not respecting a teacher, smarting off to a teacher or something, I su suppose there are levels of that, Mike. If we brought it back for a second reading, would that give us enough time, Megan, to run that question by um, either counselor or Cabe? Yeah, we can always take it off next time, and if we decide it needs more work, we can not approve it for a second reading, take it off the... I think we're not going to put this on the consent agenda, though, because we don't want to make the mistake of not addressing this issue. Um, I mean, I think we need a tight policy that it's going to get us through an expulsion hearing if there's a serious situation. That's really all I'm concerned about. 
Um, and, and I assume that, that our people will use good judgment as to whether something uh, open defiance of the authority of any teacher or person having authority over the student, including verbal abuse. Well, there's verbal abuse and there's verbal abuse. At some point, it should be a suspendable uh, offense, but probably just making a not a great comment, I would assume, wouldn't be. Just, there's a bunch of them like that, but that, that one just is easy to understand. Um, okay, good. Do we want a motion to approve for a first reading? Second? Further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstaining? Abstain. One abstention. Uh, chairman votes aye. Uh, this is approved for a first reading. Board, mem board meeting schedule for 2021. All right, within your board packet, um, I included the board meeting schedule that I have proposed. Uh, this we do need to put into uh, the state for the first of the new year. Um, I did keep the same routine that we've had this year in which it was an every three week cycle, making certain that we were looking at the, um, the holidays in order to determine the date. At this time, I did not include our committee schedules. So right now we're looking just at the proposed dates for our board meetings. We did include in their retreat dates as well as our annual meetings, setting the budget um, and our uh, first meeting of the year in which we have to determine uh, the executive board. Okay. I don't think it need, requires any action. So if there is nothing further and no objection, I would adjourn. Oh, do we need to? Oh, thank you then. Uh, we do require action. Is there a motion to adopt uh, the board meeting schedule for 2021 as presented by the superintendent? Moved. Is there a second? Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Chairman votes aye, it's unanimous. Now, is there any objection to adjourning by consent at 8.52? We are so adjourned.